Welcome uh, to everyone um, to this evening on the Oxford Dodo Culture at the Crossroads. Um, very exciting event, which is a collaboration between the Oxford Museum of Natural History, here where we are today, and Torch, which is about 400 meters over in that direction, which is the Oxford Research Center in the Humanities. And this event is also part of the Being Human Festival, which is the UK's only festival of humanities, and it includes over 160 events all across the UK just this week. So that too is very exciting, exciting to be a part of. We're very, very grateful to the Oxford University Museum of Natural History for hosting us today. In addition to the event, and I'm going to introduce the speakers in a moment, we've also had a creative writing competition about the dodo. And this has been for school children, and we're very, very pleased to announce, this was also um, very buoying to see uh, that we had over 170 children enter the competition in two categories, ages 7 to 10 and ages 11 to 14. Uh, we had entries from 36 schools from across the UK, and we're, we're very pleased that some of the prize winners are here with us this evening. And I'm going to ask them now, um, as I announce their names, to come up and receive their tickets. They also received uh, vouchers, book vouchers. So, first of all, the 7 to 10 age category. In joint third place, we have Frances Watt, who is aged eight, and she's from St. Aloysius Primary School here in Oxford. And we have Mimi Burrell, who is 10, from St. Andrew's Church of England Primary School in Headington. So could Mimi <laughs> and Francis <laughs> And then in the uh, 11 to 14 age category are as follows, um, third place, Unfortunately, couldn't be with us this evening. Uh, she's Simi Tame, age 10, from the Perth Upper School in Cambridge. Um, second place and first place, however, are here in the room with us. So, second place, uh, Evie Manton, age 11, from the Oxford Spires Academy. Evie, could you please come up and receive your certificate? <laughs> Now, after that excitement, to move to uh, the second part of this evening, where we're going to be talking about and responding to the Oxford dodo, the symbolism, the mythology, and the actuality of the Oxford dodo. Um, I'm just going to give very brief introductions to our speakers this evening, and, um, and then I'm going to, to hand over to them. So first up, we have Paul Smith, who is the director here of the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. Pietro Corsi, Emeritus Professor of the History of Science here at the University of Oxford. For, uh, Jasper Ford, the writer and author of the Thursday Next series. Paul Jepson, researcher at the School of Geography and Environment and the course director for the MSc in Biodiversity, Conservation and Management and then Kirsten Shepherd Barr, Professor of English and Theatre Studies and Knowledge Exchange Champion for the Humanities here in Oxford and linked to Torch. I also forgot to, to introduce myself. I'm Elika Verma, <laughs> and I'm the director of Torch uh, this year. So um, the speakers are going to proceed in the following order. First of all, Paul Smith, then Kirsten Shepherd Barr, followed by Pietro Corsi, followed by Paul Jepson, uh, and then uh, with Jasper Ford concluding. But first, I'm going to hand over with great pleasure to Paul Smith. Thanks very much, Alan. Just bear with me one moment. So it's my job tonight to, to set the context for the other speakers. So why is the dodo so significant? Why does it matter so much? And why does it attract so much attention? So our task for tonight is the Oxford dodo 
culture at the crossroads. And this isn't photoshopped, this is the dodo down at Land's End <laughs> earlier in the summer. <coughs> of which more anon. So, the purpose of museums really is to, to engage people with objects. That's the bottom line. Um, objects, museum objects, we call them specimens in natural history museums, have the power to tell stories, a great power to tell stories and to engage people with those stories. And really exceptional objects have the power to tell an exceptional range of stories. And for those who aren't familiar with the works of Stephen Polyakov, um, he's a, a theatre writer and a, a film writer. And some years ago, he produced a TV series called Shooting the Past, which is for me, one of the most profound insights into museum studies that's available, it's piecing together a photographic archive uh, to tell the story. If you haven't seen it, download it now, and I don't get any royalties. I would say that that's exactly what we do in museums. Um, and we seek to use those objects to tell a whole variety of stories. And tonight we're going to concentrate on the dodo, and particularly, of course, the dodo that's particular to this city, the one specimen uh, that, that uh, will inform all of our discussions, the Oxford dodo, as we'll call it. <coughs> and the dodo was taken um, from Land's End to John O'Groats earlier this summer. That's, uh, we saw the Land's End leg. This is the John O'Groats leg, um, just before it went wild in the highlands of Scotland. And uh, along the way, we attracted very large numbers of, of people who travelled anything up to three hours to see that one dodo specimen and the reconstruction that you can see in front of you. So why did people drive three hours to see that one specimen? And I think we'll flesh that out as the evening proceeds. With regards to Oxford, the, the dodo pervades the city. It's everywhere once you start looking. Um, this gargoyle is sitting on the corner of the Bodleian staring down on the Sheldonian theatre. This dodo is in Christchurch Hall, in the Lewis Carroll window. And so it's begun to infiltrate everything. If you really want to start hunting, there's a, a dodo chair somewhere amongst the several hundred in Christchurch Hall as well. And this is the one specimen that we're talking about. It's the specimen that's in front of you, and you'll have a chance to see it later on in the proceedings. And you know, it's far from being our most spectacular natural history specimen, if I'm honest. It's a rotted bird. We've only got the head and the foot left. But nonetheless, it's informed so many aspects of our culture. So let's look at some of the stories that the dodo tells. And I'll leave it to my colleagues on the panel to look at some of the other stories. <clears throat> but first of all, how did it come to Oxford? So the Oxford dodo started off life um, in London, it may or may not be a specimen that was recorded in London in 1638 where people could pay a penny to feed the dodo, um, recorded by a man called Hamel Lestrange. And a little later, a specimen is recorded in a collection of a father and son team who really founded the first museum. This is the Museum Travis uh, in what's now Vauxhall in South London. And it appears that a specimen appears in their collection catalogue in 1656. This may or may not be the same specimen, or there may have been two dodos that came uh, to, to London as live specimens. It's transferred to the Ashmolean Museum in 1659 in somewhat controversial circumstances. Uh, the Travis could sell the collection to Elias Ashmole, who founds the collection. Um, Tr John Travis, the younger's wife, disputes the will. Um, and takes Elias Ashmole to court. She loses. She's then found face down, drowned in the garden pond next door to Elias Ashmole's house. So it's all very controversial from the start. And then it becomes a specimen that we study scientifically later on. This is the site of the Tra museum Travisconteanum now, and it's somehow appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a fried chicken bar. 
It comes to, to Oxford and it features in, in the, the old Ashmolean Museum, what's now the Museum of the History of Science. And although we don't, can't see the specimen, we can see the painting that's downstairs uh, by Savary um, at the end of, of the old Ashmolean, which was given the splendid name, the Nick Nacker Tree, which I remind the director of the Ashmolean frequently. <laughs> so where did dodos come from? So they were found on this island here, Mauritius. And they were found probably initially by Portuguese sailors who were beginning to explore the, the Indian Ocean, um, but they were first described fully by Dutch sailors who were doing the same. Um, and the other island that we'll refer to a little later on is this island, Rodriguez, uh, which is a few hundred kilometres to the east. So the Dutch first described the dodo in 1598. Uh, this is their arrival um, on Mauritius. It was clearly a land of plenty. It was important that it was a land of plenty because they wanted to stock up their ships um, as they explored the Indian Ocean. And Mauritius was the first landfall after they turned the southern Cape of Africa. You can see the very first illustration of a dodo lurking in the trees there. They bigged it up a little bit, as uh, explorers are prone to do. But nonetheless, it's a reasonably accurate, if vicious beaked, looking organism. The sad thing is that that's the first description in 1598. It was extinct by 1662, 64 years from first discovery to extinction. And we'll come back to that here, where this is an early uh, painting recently found, uh, the last illustration of a, of a living dodo. Um, and so this is the first really clear-cut example uh, of, of where humans have found a new species and driven it to extinction within a few decades. And therefore, it, it's become something of a, a poster child, along with giant pandas, uh, for human-induced extinction. So the first of our stories that it tells, and the most obvious story that it tells, is with, with regards to um, humans driving species to extinction. The reason it was driven to extinction was because, precisely because the Dutch were using Mauritius to stock up as they explored the Indian Ocean. So, first of all, they tried eating dodos. That wasn't entirely satisfactory from anyone's perspective. Um, and you'll notice from my first slide, I'll look all the way back, there are two words for, for dodo in Dutch. Uh, one is, is valvo, which translates as approximately insipid bird. It didn't matter how long you cooked it, how you cooked it, it still tasted pretty nasty and greasy. Um, but dodo itself comes from dodars, which is the old Dutch for, for fat arse or fat bum, um, which you can see it does possess um, and is also an indication that it might not have been the best eating possible. So humans did cause extinction, but they didn't cause it by eating dodos to death. They were easy to catch. If you pick one up by the feet, it would squawk and all the other dodos would come uh, to... to uh, find out who was squawking, at which point you could knock them on the head and take them back to the boat. But actually what did for dodos was the introduction of pigs, which the Dutch introduced to provision their ships um, as they sailed across the Indian Ocean. So the, the pigs ate the same food on the ground as the dodos, um, but they also ate dodo eggs. So not a, a good tale. That map is one of the first illustrations of the Indian Ocean, and of course the story proceeds to exploring the whole Indian Ocean uh, out to a rudimentary Australia and Southeast Asia. And, and so in a, an indirect way, the dodo tells stories and is directly involved in Western European exploration of the Orient, of, of Eastern Asia, um, and the general exploration and mapping of the, of the globe. So another important story for the dodo. This is a, a deliberately complicated bit of science, just to remind us that it tells really important scientific stories. It's six o'clock, apparently. Um, the specimen that we have here in Oxford is the only one that preserves soft tissues. It's the only one that we can do DNA analysis on. And because of that, it's been sampled uh, about 12 years ago, 15 years ago, and the paper came out in 2002, um, and it resolves dodos as sitting in this group here. Now, you won't be able to read all the names, 
But basically, all of these names surrounding the dodo are pigeons. So the dodo, despite its rather weird appearance, is basically a very large, flightless pigeon. And it's, this is one of the least surprising pieces of genetic research that's been done um, in, the, in the past 30 years, because actually the first anatomist who described the dodo in 1824 predicted off the, the anatomy of the skeleton uh, that it was exactly that, a dodo. Sorry, a pigeon. They also predicted it was a dodo. Uh, this is an alternative way of, of looking at it. And uh, you'll see that actually it sits amongst this group, the crowned pigeons. We have a crowned pigeon in all its glory sitting there. Um, and the next closest relative is, is a thing called the tooth-billed pigeon. The dodo um, and its near relatives would sit just here. We're not quite sure of the, the structure of this uh, in terms of the final uh, resolved relationships uh, of, of dodos, but they are definitely uh, pigeons and they're definitely closely related to the crowned pigeons. The nearest relative is also extinct. It lived on that adjacent island of Rodriguez, a few hundred kilometres to the east, also found in the early 1600s by the Dutch, extinct by the early 1700s. It lasted a few decades longer. Extinct for the very self-same reasons, introduction of pigs, and um, destruction of habitat. And that's a lesson for all conservation biology studies because that's the most common means of inducing extinction. It's not that we directly kill things, it's that we destroy habitat. So this is the nearest living relative of the dodo. Uh, we have a, a few uh, preserved specimens that we'll take down to the museum for you to look at, but the photograph gives you a much better idea of the animal. The Nicobar pigeon is common all the way down the Indian Ocean, um, and is a perfectly typical flighted pigeon. The next closest relative uh, are these things, the crowned pigeons. This is uh, one species, that's the, another species, there are three in total. This is the Victoria crowned pigeon, a spectacular and large bird. Um, and another lesson in terms of biological conservation is that the little dodo the next closest relative is actually, again, on the list of most endangered birds globally. It's the 34th most endangered bird in the world. We're not learning our lessons. That group is particularly prone to human interference and extinction, um, and it may or may not survive. But the power of the dodo is the fact that, as we will hear in a moment, it crosses over into other spheres of human activity. It crosses over into the into Dutch landscape and uh, still life art in the early 1600s. Uh, particularly, a, uh, an uncle and nephew team called uh, the Savarys, Roland and Jan Savary. Um, and here is a dodo uh, drinking from a river with an assemblage of birds that the Dutch had discovered as they explored the globe. It tells that global exploration story as well. So we have Amazonian parrots. We have the first. Uh, known illustration of a cassowary from Papua New Guinea. Um, so it, it's, it's telling the story about all the things that the Dutch have discovered as well as illustrating the dodo. There's a suspicion that all of these rather fat dodos are not as they were. Um, they were probably all kept in captivity. They were probably all rather overfed because there was a temptation to feed a penny to pay, uh, feed, pay a penny to feed the dodo. Um, and these were probably rather obese individuals, as is the one illustrated downstairs in, in our museum. This is, again, by uh, Roland Savary. And his less artistically accomplished nephew, uh, <laughs> Jan Savary. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have a copy of the former painting and the original of this one. I'd rather it was the other way around. Um, there are some better, probably more anatomically correct reconstructions. This is a... a, a previously unpublished Dutch uh, painting that was auctioned at Christie's in 2009 and shows a much more anatomically lifelike bird. But probably the best of the bunch is this one uh, from the Mughal emperors. Some, the, some dodos made their way into the, uh, the Indian Empire, the Mughal Empire, uh, where they were kept um, as, as garden pets. And here they reconstruct a, a much more slim line of slightly aggressive looking bird. And dark, they almost certainly wear two different colorways, this, this gray form and this dark form. May have been boys and girls, we're not 100% sure. And then, 
again, as we'll hear in a moment, but I'll just briefly introduce it, the dodo crosses over into literature. And, and it crosses over to literature in this building because it was in this building that Charles Dodgson, a mathematician, uh, brought a little girl called Alice to look at the museum objects. And that encapsulates the dodo within Alice's adventures in Wonderland. Directly from looking at museum stories and telling stories, uh, museum objects and telling stories about museum objects. And once it gets into to Lewis Carroll, uh, Charles Dodgson's writing name, then it really does begin to go everywhere globally uh, as a cultural phenomenon. So the illustration by John Tenniel uh, in the 1860s begins to uh, iconise the, the dodo. It's picked up in 1896 by uh, Hilaire Belloc in his Bad Charles Book of Beasts. Not the best poem. The dodo used to walk around and take the sun and air. The sun yet warms his native ground. The dodo is not there. <laughs> the voice which used to squawk and squeak is now forever dumb. Yet you may see his bones and beak all in the museum. <laughs> 18, the 1950s, it makes it into Disney, and it really is becoming a global phenomenon by that point. And then the final step in the elevation of the dodo to, to a global cultural icon is that, of course, it, it then makes an appearance as a star uh, in a film by the makers of, of Wallace and Gromit. And you really know that your museum object has made it when it appears in a film by the makers of Wallace and Gromit. So... This museum, as our Twitter handle says, is more than a dodo, uh, but the dodo is very important, and I'll let other members of the panel just flesh that out for us. So we'll play Pass the Parcel now, and I'll hand over to, to Kirsten Shepherd Barr. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, let's see if I can find... Just bear with me a second. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to, I just don't want to promise a kind of complete record of every appearance of the dodo in literature by that title, but I do want to touch on a few examples um, and pick up on some of the things that Paul laid out for us. So Victorians were fascinated by extinct creatures. Dickens begins Bleak House, 1852, with an unforgettable image of the fog waddling through London like a megalosaurus 40 feet long. Tennyson, Shaw, and many other writers invoke the megatherium, a genus of elephant-sized ground sloth. The dodo was an even better icon of extinction because it seemed so familiar, a bird with beak and feathers, and on a human scale, and much more recent, so within human memory. <clears throat> oh, hang on a second. Here we go. Um, so Thomas Hardy, in The Return of the Native, 1878, has Venn the Redelman, so Redel was this red ochre that um, had to be distributed to the sheep farmers so they could mark their sheep. Um, and Venn is described as, quote, one of a class rapidly becoming extinct in Wessex, filling at present in the rural world the place which, during the last century, the dodo occupied in the world of animals. He is a curious, interesting, and nearly perished link between obsolete forms of life and those which generally prevail. Um, so this is an example of that, the, the frequency, the, the dodo crops up frequently in Victorian writing, um, and often as if it's only recently disappeared. Um, so he's raising a, awareness of the passing of age-old rural traditions that will soon become extinct, but he's slightly off on his timing of the dodo's extinction. And Ibsen does the same. Art forms like species of animals can become extinct, he says. Verse drama is one such example. It will meet the same fate as the dodo, quote, of which only a few individuals remain down on an African island. This is in a letter of 1883. So um, he's way off as the last sighting, as we've heard, was 200 years earlier. But there seems to be a sort of wish, wish to, to, to um, bring it back. And we see this, of course, in Alice. And we'll talk about that in a second. 
Um, and the next just brief example I want to touch on is uh, Kipling and Captains Courageous, 1897. There's a navy that is, quote, more extinct than the dodo. And of course, he's overdoing it a bit because we can debate this, but arguably extinction is absolute. You can't have degrees of it, more extinct uh, or less extinct. Um, so on to Alice in Wonderland. So this um, launched the dodo, as Paul said, into its literary fame. Here is the passage in which the dodo is introduced as part of a group of bedraggled creatures on a riverbank. They were indeed a queer-looking party that assembled on the bank, the birds with draggled feathers, the animals with their fur clinging close to them, and all dripping wet, cross, and uncomfortable. So here's another passage that may ring bells with people um, about creatures on a riverbank from a few years earlier. And this is something that Robert Douglas Fairhurst explores in some depth in his wonderful new book uh, called Alice. Um, and the passage from Darwin is, it is interesting to contemplate a tangled bank clothed with many plants of many kinds, with birds singing on the bushes, with various insects flitting about, and with worms crawling through the damp earth. And of course, that is from the famous final paragraph of On the Origin of Species in 1859. Now, we know that Carroll was deeply interested in evolutionary thought. After On the Origin of Species came out, he bought no fewer than 19 works by Darwin or his critics, together with five by Herbert Spencer. One of the things that connects Darwin and Carroll, I think, is their fascination with language and narrative. Darwin tells a story of biodiversity, but with no human characters in it yet. He will do that in Descent of Man in 1871. Carroll creates a Darwinian narrative driven by aggression, survival, and transformation. As Douglas Fairhurst puts it, quote, almost every creature is at risk of being killed or eaten. Alice's story is, in John Bailey's words, an essay in the art of survival. Carol's dodo is a very dignified figure who speaks gravely and solemnly and is the one everyone turns to for a solution to the problem of how to dry out after being soaked in Alice's pool of tears. He proposes a caucus race no one really knows what a caucus race is, but we can assume that it is a race in which everyone runs around at the same time in utter chaos, perhaps Carol getting in a dig at college committees. <laughs> Notice in Tennille's wonderful picture that the dodo has human hands. He's pointing to Alice. And Douglas Fairhurst suggests a link here with the pantomime. <clears throat> it looks as if it's a, a guy in a, a pantomime suit. He's, he could just cast off. The race is over, they all shout. They all crowded around it, panting and asking, but who has won? This question the dodo could not answer without a great deal of thought, and it stood for a long time with one finger pressed upon its forehead, the position in which you usually see Shakespeare in the pictures of him. The dodo's solution is nice, but probably isn't that viable, everybody winning. Such an outcome doesn't seem compatible with natural selection. In the struggle for life, this would be highly unfavorable to survival, though it does raise an alternative vision of cooperation rather than competition. But note the mention of Shakespeare, another interesting link that elevates the dodo to immortal literary status. There he is. Sorry, that's a little small. It's the best I could do. But they have a lot in common, not least that relatively little is known about their lives in comparison with their global cultural resonance and reach. So we have to reconstitute them from mere traces, which means that we endlessly speculate about the facts of their lives, but we can never fully know them. And, but this, in turn, gives imaginative freedom. And continuing with the Shakespeare motif, this image comes from <laughs> the note paper of the most prolific collector of dodo paraphernalia in Britain, Ralph Whistler, who continues the link to Shakespeare, this time making dodos of both Hamlet and Yorick. So I want to draw a little bit more on some of the other um, things I think are going on in relation to the dodo in Alice in Wonderland. I think the Cheshire cat has a lot in common with the dodo. They're not normally s compatible in our minds, the cat and the bird, but there's a deepening of the motifs of reconstitution, disappearance, and recovery that underpin the novel. 
The dodo has vanished, leaving only a few bones. We have to fill out the rest of the body, which, unlike the cat, cannot miraculously come and go at will. It also shows an animal that is wiser and more knowing than the human, also a key motif in Carol's work. And here, both literally and figuratively, sitting in a superior position, looking down on the human. The critic Rose Lovell Smith notes that animals in Alice never acknowledge their inferiority. In fact, it conjures a world of human and animal interchangeability, she says, underscored by Tenniel's drawings of the fingers on the dodo and the grin on the cat, which is all that remains. But the dodo has two characters, if you like, the serious and the comical. The comic aspect derives from the apparently clumsy, awkward, comical gait and facial expression, unusual beak, and placid demeanor, allegedly. In this respect, a bit like another endangered animal, the manatee. The idea, perhaps, that it was a bit dim. This comes across in King Dodo, an operetta from 1901 that was very popular and deals with an autocratic, harmless, comical king, quote, a jolly old potentate, in very sort of Gilbert and Sullivan style. And you can listen to excerpts from a 1912 recording on the Library of Congress website. And this comes from um, our collection in the Bodleian. So you can consult the entire sc score of this operetta. I want to finish with um, a brief mention of the dodo in more recent work, here in Terry Johnson's 1984 play, Cries from the Mammal House. In the final moments of this play, an ornithologist studying birds on Mauritius has an extraordinary experience with its indigenous people. These are the stage directions. Suddenly he is thrown into a pool of light. It is dim all around him. He stands up and peers into the darkness. Strange noises surround him. He is terrified. When he sees what it is in the pit into which he has been thrown, he begins to make a sound himself, half scream, half astonishment. And at the end of the play, he narrates what happened next. And there was something there. In the middle of the light it stood, blinking its eyes and wondering why on earth it had been woken up at this ungodly hour. It was a dodo. And it looked at me, I swear to God, and it opened its beak and it made the daftest sound I've ever heard. And then the stage direction is, from the crate there issues an absurd cry, which echoes around the mammal house. So the play not only invokes the elusive song of the dodo, we will never know what its cry was like, but it also brings to the fore the post-colonial problem Paul alluded to. What destroyed the species in the first place was colonial Dutch sailors invading the island and eradicating the dodo. Here, this process is upended as the ornithologist is captured by the local people who then reveal that they have preserved the species intact by hiding it from the West. The play ends with this moment when he brings live dodos back to his brother's zoo in England. For Victorians, as Gillian Beer has pointed out, extinction was not necessarily a bad thing. In Darwin's writing, it is just part of life, part of the cycle of loss and gain. Now, in the Anthropocene age, species loss takes on an entirely different meaning, one of sadness and irretrievable loss, depletion, and devastation, mostly wrought by human hands. The dodo lives on in Johnson's play, echoing around the mammal house. One critic called this upbeat ending Quote, a moment of pure theater that sends you out into the night feeling better for having made the journey. Thank you. Thanks, Kirsten. And we'll, we'll now hand over to Pietro Corsi. Let me try to find out where my PowerPoint is. Is it still here? Uh, no, I don't think it is there. Give me a second. Oh, sorry about that. I didn't open it first, so that's the reason why. My first introduction to the dodo was in 1973, freshly arrived from Italy to start my defil. And it was not in this museum, Paul, I'm afraid, but it was a sentence I read on the back of the Mathematics Institute here in St. Giles. It was a huge, gigantic writing 
the only remnant of 68 in Oxford, and this sentence says, you are all dodos for the professors to look at. Then I learn a bit more, and I worked on the dodo a lot for reasons that will become clear now. What I'm going to say now is, is, is a homage to species of intellectuals who were not as lucky as the dodo. They did not survive. In fact, they were actively killed by skilled owners of scientific truth, but they existed nevertheless. And the dodo has a place in the history of evolution, broadly understood. A place that justifies the reasons why the famous French anatomist Cuvier came here to Oxford in 1830 to study the bones. And why Richard Owen in London started to work systematically on the dodo and why a man called Hugh Strickland in 1848 published the first systematic study on the dodo. The chap that has been completely forgotten, I think, is this young man here with an extraordinary name, Jean-Baptiste Genevieve Marcelin Boris de Saint-Vincent. <laughs> it's all France, and we probably should think about our French friends now. But uh, it is here in, in his uh, old age, but the previous lies is when he goes on a trip together with Captain Baudin, that is the Baudin expedition. Two ships that they go to Australia. They even meet Captain Flinders, they exchange civilities, and in spite of the war between England and France, British authorities help the expedition of Captain Baudin. Here is a view of Tenerife taken by Bory, who was a very good draftman. And here I stole an, a, a slide from, from Paul to remind you where where these islands are, the Mascareigne Islands. And uh, Bory concentrated on the Ile de France, which is Mauritius. Maurice, called by the indigenous populations, the French indigenous population, Mauritius after 1810, when the British troops uh, invaded it. And then in 1814 and 1815, with the settlement of Europe, uh, that Mauritius became part of the British Empire. Uh, in 1801, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Bory uh, uh, jumps a ship, and, and together with another 11 naturalists, they were all young enthusiasts. They wanted to see the world, but they underestimated how hard it is to live on a ship, and so they took the first chance to abandon it. And, uh, and, 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 and Bory remained there for almost one year, but he spent an entire month in, 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 in uh, uh, Mauritius. He wrote about it in 1804 in a book called Voyage dans les quatre principales îles des mers d'Afrique. And there is a long chapter in volume three in which explains how the dodo plays a fundamental role in a materialistic, history of the earth and of life. We are not within our evolutionary frame of reference, but we are within a common evolutionary frame of reference at the time, which later evolutionists and certain historians have decided to completely neglect. Which is the reasoning of, of Boris de saint Vincent? It's very simple. He goes to describe how Mauritius is not even a pinhead, is the point of a pin in the oceans. He examines the likelihood that forms of life are taken there by ships or by, by uh, 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 how do you say that, gales. And he says some yes, others not. And he elaborates a very successful theory, he is one among many, who believe that life is a kind of legal puzzle, is a combination of chemical molecules that combine and recombine, and once you have life molecules active, then you have going up the ladder of complexity. However, he says, in, in Mauritius, what happened was that the island is relatively young, 
and the dodo bear the marks of the haste with which nature tried to create life. And so he examines, for instance, the fact that on Mauritius there are a lot of polymorphic and dimorphic plants. And that means that his plants that have great differences in their parts to the point that botanists have thought they were different species. No, they are the same species. Boris says, well, the dodo is exactly the same. That is, it's a nature that tries quickly to build up the Lego of, Lego of life, you know, the great combinations. And he had a good teacher there because, of course, we are also in this age of global history, the only people we don't work on are the people who were there before. And here is the teacher of Bury in La Réunion, which is still French territory, Joseph Hubert, who was a naturalist, second generation born, who was there and was extremely active in the acclimatization of pepper plants and other spices in order to break the monopoly of the Dutch, which they succeeded in doing. So, it is interesting that Bory is never mentioned in the huge literature on the, on, the, on, the, on the dodo, but simply referred to as a traveler who mentioned the dodo. Well, he was much more than that. But let's jump another, another 20 years. He publishes, <coughs> from 1822, Bory is the editor of a Dictionnaire Classique d'Histoire Naturelle, classical dictionary of natural history. You may be more interested if I tell you that that is the only dictionary that travels with Darwin in his cabin on the Beagle, the only one. And it is a dictionary which is the summary of non-Lamarckian and non-Darwinian evolutionary theories. Of course, they could not be Darwinian because Darwin is not yet there. But certainly it is very interesting work which I read several times over. And there is an article called Creation, Creation, in which the same arguments that I told you about are repeated. You know, these animals cannot have come here from nowhere because it doesn't exist anywhere. Could it have come from Madagascar or from Africa? It could, but there are none of these kind of birds there. So it must have been produced on the island, which means that nature is extremely active in producing lives, lives, forms of life, even sophisticated one. Now, is this just a French story? Well, it is not. Uh, let me just finish the French story with one thing. The famous Cuvier knew Bory very well and hated him. And Cuvier and Bory wrote several times attacking Cuvier and saying, Cuvier is blocking the advancement of science with his unreasonable creationism. But in 1830, life changes its situation, 1829 in fact, a school friend of Bory becomes the most powerful man in France, the, the Marquis de, de, de Martignac. And he, this Marquis, charges uh, Bory to become the head of a big natural history expedition that France is organizing in Greece. Now, Cuvier has to make terms with these men, and they meet every week to discuss this plan. It is Boris's highest point of notoriety in Europe. The Dictionnaire Classique is translated into Italian, it is commented in Spanish newspapers, in German magazines, it is known everywhere. How does it cross the channel? Very easy. First of all, Dictionnaire Classique, as I said, was traveling, in Darwin's ship, but also a famous literary person, John Wilson, also called Christopher North, a famous commentator and writer from Edinburgh, reviewed Bory de Saint Vincent theories in the influential Edinburgh Review. And rather sympathetically, I'm not going to read that, you may read that if you want, but Wilson catches the point, is nature in fact still active in producing life. Isn't the dodo telling us this story? Or isn't Bory telling us the story of the dodo that tells us this story? Is it finished there? It is not finished there. Because John Wilson, or Christopher North, who writes hundreds of articles for the press because he's very rich, then his uncle loses all the money, so he has to work like crazy to write for magazines, and that's what he does. 
And he reviews also the book I mentioned before by Strickland. What had happened in between, I already mentioned. Cuvier comes to Oxford in 1830 to look at the bones to see whether something could be done. He is sure that it cannot be what Boris says, a single bird somewhere lost in the Indian Ocean. So it must be worked out. He doesn't continue the work, he dies in 1832. But Richard Owen, a famous conservative, extremely good anatomist in London, also called the British Cuvier, takes on and starts working on the families, the, this funny and nice looking Donald Duck pigeon uh, uh, was part of. And then of course Strickland, uh, who died in one of the earliest nasty uh, uh, railways accidents, is doing the geology of, of, of a cut, of a train cut and he sees a train coming, so he moves on the other trail, on the other rail, but another train is coming from the other direction, and poor, and is not as lucky as the, as the Dodo, and Strickland died. But Wilson writes a review of that, and look here what he does. He puts together the Galapagos and the Dodo. That is, uh, Wilson, quoting Strickland, now says, well, maybe, what we know now, we can say that there were a lot of birds-like forms, like the dodo, in that huge area. And they adapted to different environments, a bit like in the Galapagos, where birds, reptiles, and uh, tortoises, or, and iguanas, and well, iguanas are reptiles, are coming from the continent, but they have adapted each to each island forming new species. I'm not saying that that is uh, following the steps of Darwin. I simply say that this kind of stories cannot be forgotten simply because we are eliminating entire part of the history of, for instance, evolution only in order to please people like Cuvier and later on Owen who denied that the dodo was interesting not only as a lost bird, but also as a chapter in the history of life. Thank you. And from evolution to environment, and Paul Jepson. Oh. My name's Paul Jepson. Something I, uh, something I quite like doing in my spare time or when I'm thinking is thinking about why do some species become iconic and other species don't? So if I was asked to, if I asked you, how many animal icons have we got out there in the world? Anybody want to pitch in a suggestion? No, how many? I said, not just the one. You know, roughly 10, 100, 1,000, 5,000. I'm afraid I don't know, <laughs> but hopefully by Christmas we will know because we've just scraped the web to try and find out. But actually, when I've been thinking about this, every time we ask that question, you start off thinking there's loads of them, but then actually you start coming back to the same ones again and again. And it seems that actually animal icons are quite a rare thing out there. So I want to come in with this. So why is this the animal icon of extinction? Why, isn't, why aren't we looking at a fabulous moa bird or our own extinct flightless bird, the great orc? Or why aren't we looking at something you know, really glorious like the uh, Norfolk Island kaka? Why is it that the dodo is there and we're thinking about it and from this perspective as the icon of extinction? I think we're getting at why here in this discussion because it has inhabited multiple stories. It's been around, if you like, <laughs> in the human imagination. But then it comes to the question of, so, but why the dodo? Why was the dodo able to inhabit all of these different stories? And I'll suggest that, you know, I'll just throw out four or five reasons why that might be. I think one reason is that 
it was the first bird which, you know, we knowingly caused the extermination of it. But I think there's other things about, about that bird which have helped it to inhabit stories. One is its size. So if you think about it now, it's just that perfect size. It's small enough to be part of a group, but big enough to be a character. Yeah? So it can fit into those paintings. It can fit into those groups Kirsten was talking about. Sometimes when I'm walking around the museum and looking at other objects here, I think about the albatross. And the albatross just having that perfect size in a museum and in a story. It's not big and dominating like the, you know, the big um, uh, skeletons out here, the, the old mammoth skeletons and so forth. But it's, it, it's big enough that you sort of think, oh yeah, it's there, and you take notice of it. It sits well uh, within, within stories. Second, which we've all touched on, it's got a pretty quirky phenotype, hasn't it? Yeah? On a ranking of 1 to 10, what do you think? Definitely up there, 8, 9 in terms of quirkiness. And there is something about us humans. We do love quirkiness in stories. Jeremy Vine's dancing strictly just wouldn't have been the same story this year without him, would it? Yeah? We bring in quirkiness into our stories, and it's got that. It's got that part uh, of, the, of the phenotype. Thirdly, and I was trying to capture this in this, uh, um, in this sketching here, it's got that aura of helpless maladaptation. This is the panda thing. There's something about it when, when things just, it, you know, I don't know, something went wrong in it. We, we, we bring them into our compassion and our stories, and they stick in, in our mind. Fourth, I think another reason why this might be might have become the icon and inhabited those stories is because getting close to a dodo was always a very rare experience. It was, you know, rare to see it, who got to Mauritius, but equally when it came over here, it was a very rare thing to see, or as it became, uh, you know, it became very rare um, uh, museum exhibits. You needed to live in Oxford to get access to those exhibits. You need to have good connections with friends like Paul to get access and get close to these specimens that get close to the, the essence of the dodo. dodo. I think that probably gave it some sort of cachet amongst writers and, uh, and thinkers and scientists at the time. You know, you're getting close to something which very few people had. It had that sort of prestige and privilege to it. And lastly, there's the, the name. As my students will tell you, I'm not very good at remembering names. But Dodo, no problem. Yeah? It just sticks in your mind. It's perfect. So the point I'm getting at here is that because of these characteristics, these traits of the Dodo, it was able to become long-term inhabitants of stories, such that when we got the rise of journalism in the 19th century, and when we got that rash of extinctions coming through in, in the late uh, 19th century, those stories being reported in the news about the loss of the pantheon pigeon, the loss of the great orc or whatever, that evidence, that fact, through the dodo, could connect with stories and multiple knowledge practices. So that news about extinction didn't just come in, oh, it's news, it came in, oh, hang on, I've heard about the dodo. And through the dodo, it fed in, the concept of extinction fed in to all of these different uh, branches of cultured thinking um, and, and life, you know, from, from high science to gluttony uh, or whatever. And that means for me that with that sort of assembly, connective action of the dodo, the story of the dodo became more of a story, more than a story, rather. It became what we call a frame. And a frame is a particular type of story. It's a constellation of ideas, metaphors, experiences, which we bring together to make sense and act within a complex world. Frames like uh, freedom, aid, terrorism, how we as humans make sense of complexity. And frames are particularly powerful forms of stories, because not only do they enable us to make sense, they enable us to collectively uh, act. And maybe this is where we start thinking about the significance of the dodo uh, as an icon and its connective uh, role in this. Extinction was a really powerful frame, because in terms of perhaps our, our own human morality, it started saying that we had moral duties to avoid, to knowingly avoid the extinction of other species. That through human actions, it was not right to exterminate other life forms. Now, that was quite a radical frame when it was starting to come in, when we think that perhaps the dominant frame 
uh, at that time, or at least this old established frame, that only, was that only God can create, what, uh, destroy what he has created. So it's always to see for me that this story of the dodo is a very influential frame. And it's a frame which has then sort of gone through into the creation of red lists of extinction, into species protection law. In many ways, it has helped co-produce our modern institutions of conservation. So what's the dodo's future as an icon? We can say it's an icon of extinction now, and perhaps it has been for 130, 140 years. Is it going to still be that icon of extinction going ahead? If we all turned up again, if we could turn up again, I can't, in 50 or 100 years' time, will it be a dodo up there which we're thinking about with extinction? Well, if I could get this to work... Uh, oh, it's that one. I think it's got a challenger at the moment. And that's perhaps because the big exciting new idea now is that it may not be as dead as a dodo, extinction may not be forever, maybe through science we can start doing de-extinction. And the mammoth is rapidly becoming the icon of de-extinction. And we could actually talk about all of the different places uh, and different stories which the mammoth occupies. And it seems that this is starting to create this new redemptive frame linked to extinction. So what I'm going to sort of... Oh, and the point here, of course, is that the dodo can never be resurrected because the extinction of the dodo has gone so far that there is just no DNA left of it. In contrast, the mammoth... I mean, the DNA is a bit of a mess, but techniques are getting to the state where the mammoth genome is starting to be reconstructed. We could never do that with the dodo. So the dodo can never transform to become an icon of de-extinction, whereas the mammoth could actually do both. So what I'm going to throw out here, and maybe this is something we might uh, end up uh, uh, dis discussing, is that while dead, dead as a dodo is, is a truism, but I'm not sure that it will continue the dodo as an icon into the future. I think actually that the dodo as a cultural icon may be slipping towards extinction. Thank you. And finally, we'll hear from Jasper Ford. Um, I, I don't, hello. Hello. Um, I, I don't actually have any slides because I think some, some sort of, um, I don't know, come, some witch caused a hex on the Ford family seven centuries ago that no technology would ever work for us. Um, and uh, my car keeps on breaking down and uh, it seems that my iPad is the only thing that works. So I stay away from it. But I did bring, I don't know whether you can uh, see it down there, I did bring a little, little warning sign um, of Dodo, just there, a little triangular warning sign that I painted and we'll sort of get onto that um, in a minute. Um, I, I, I am a fantasy writer. Uh, I'm a, uh, a, yes, I, I'm a fiction writer. Um, and all of us in the arts and sciences, um, I think either through pursuit of knowledge or perhaps our imaginations, we try to make an imperfect world slightly better. The wonderful thing about being a fiction writer is I can do it quicker. <laughs> all I have to do is think it up, and it is so. Which is a wonderful position to be in, um, sort of almost sort of, you know, omni powerful, if you like. Um, I have a series of books, um, I can, uh, shameless plug, uh, I have a series of books, uh, my protagonist is Thursday Next, she lives in a strange, slightly off-kilter, parallel world, which is like ours, but um, slightly more so, is how I describe it, a rather exaggerated world, in which things are sort of different. Um, Wales is a socialist republic, uh, the Crimean War is still on, People love literature far more than they do here. For instance, I mean, instead of having uh, football hooliganism, which thankfully we don't have so much anymore, but in uh, Thursday Next World's, uh, World, we have um, Elizabethan play, um, playwright hooliganism, where those following Shakespeare will um, gratifyingly beat up those who prefer Marlowe on a Saturday night after a few beers. <laughs> um, a kind of world I, I rather like. Um, you know, no less violent, but much more educated which is kind of nice. Well, 
This sort of brings on to one other aspect of Thursday Next World, is that some technology is way behind. There is uh, very little uh, electronic um, uh, wizardry, um, certainly no PowerPoint, luckily for me. Um, but genetic revolution has happened rather rapidly and is highly advanced. Um, creatures have been brought back from extinction. And of course, as the poster child of, uh, uh, of extinction, the dodo, I thought we should bring back the dodo. Um, as simply as a pet, actually, because I think the wonderful thing about humans is that when we have technology, um, it generally is used, or not generally, sometimes is used for very banal reasons. So I thought maybe the dodo would come back, but um, only for just as a pet and a bit of interesting sort of fun. Um, I'll go back a bit and uh, perhaps explain why I decided to have this strange genetic revolution within the, within the pages of this book. I would, interestingly enough, I, I used to work in the film industry, and in 1997 I was working on a film called Quills, which takes place um, sort of just after the... Um, sort of French Revolution. And we were shooting here in Oxford um, a, a sequence with, um, after, well, during the terror, really. Um, and we have a guillotine set up outside the Bodleian Library um, with uh, cartloads of very terrified looking French aristocrats. Um, not real ones, obviously, um, uh, but uh, extras. And uh, it was uh, high summer, and of course there were lots and lots of tourists, and they kept on sort of watching what was going on with great amusement and not a little confusion, and asked uh, me what was going on, and I would say sort of various things like, um, oh, we're reenacting the thinning of the dons, um, <laughs> something, that, something that used to happen, you know, a few years ago, but they've stopped doing it now. Um, and they used to go, oh, really, and wander on. Um, but during the lunch break, I, um, I decided to wander over to um, the, uh, of course, the best natural history uh, museum in the UK. There is another one apparently in London, um, which is a, a sort of, you know, a sort of rather sort of, um, sort of um, meagre uh, copy, if you like. Um, but I wandered in here because I'm a huge fan of, of, uh, of Lewis Carroll, Charles Dodgson, um, who had a stutter, um, and that's where the dodo, we believe, why he was interested in having the dodo as a sort of character, you know, really him, when he's the dodo in the, in, in the book, he is actually that dodo. So uh, I'm also a huge fan of uh, Sir John Tenniel, who did the, the, the illustrations in the Alice books. And I have, this, I have this sort of notion that they would have talked about the illustrations, and we kind of think they did, and they used to, dis he said, you know, what, what sort of he wanted from these illustrations and, and everything. And I figured that they met here in the Natural History Museum in front of a stuffed dodo and described it. So I wanted to do it as a sort of pilgrimage, so I came over here, and I sort of stood there and stared at the, um, the dodo. And at the time, um, the, the, the foot and the head had just been removed from display, so there's two little areas where it used to be, and the little card saying it had been removed. So I walked over to the, um, to the uh, shop, and I said, um, uh, wh where's the dodo head gone? Because I was kind of interested in seeing it. Uh, and, and she said, well, it's gone over, off for DNA analysis. And I said, oh, that's interesting. Think, think. You see how a, a fiction writer's uh, brain starts working. And I, so I, I very quickly said, um, uh, do you have any dodo home cloning kits <laughs> in the shop, you see? And, and this being... Um, and this being uh, Oxford, of course, quick as a flash, she came back, uh, she came back to me and said, oh, uh, come back in about two or three years. <laughs> um, we might have something. So uh, I went home, and, uh, and that night, uh, Thursday next, my character, getting back to that, she had a pet cat uh, called Newton for many, many years, because this was a book I've been writing for a few years. And poor Newton was unfortunately deleted um, uh, at a stroke that weekend, and a dodo was added instead. Um, but because I like to put a satirical bent on my books, I thought, right, well, let's bring back dodos, and um, we can get home cloning kits, which is basically a sort of uh, an egg whisk, a wooden spoon, a set of instructions, a denucleated dove egg, and, you know, and you just make it with, in, in the kitchen with a sort of microwave oven, uh, and bing, you know, there's a dodo. You know, nice and simple. We don't want to make these things complicated, really, do we? Um, uh, but I thought, right, well, what do we do with a dodo when it came back? Well, I thought... Dodo fanciers would be like people who are interested in, oh, I don't know, sort of Ford Escorts. So I thought there'd be a, a Dodo fancier club, and you'd, you'd argue over what you had. You know, well, I've got a version 1.23. You go, oh, really? Well, that wasn't very good, actually, because they sequenced it better in the 1.3.8 version. And, and as it turned out, um, Thursday's um, Dodo is called Pickwick, and is a version 1.12, the earliest uh, Dodo that there was. Um, and the interesting thing, I think, about uh, Pickwick, 
uh, Thursday's dodo, is that they sequenced him or her, we're not sure quite, um, with, without built-in senescence. Uh, and this becomes a, an interesting point later on because this dodo will live forever. And I think that was a rather nice point because what, we do, what I did was I take a, a, a beast that had, been, uh, uh, that had been extinct for a long time and I brought it back and, and made, it, made it live forever, which I kind of liked, and I will pick it up later in, in my books to use as a sort of motif. But um, also the thing about um, dozos is um, they, we bring them back, um, they, they, you know, were great fun, we have sort of, you know, hugely enjoyable. Um, we get bored with them, as humans are apt to do. Uh, we release them into the wild, and that's why we have a warning sign about dodos just down here. We release them into the wild, they breed, um, and they ge generate huge amounts of numbers, and we have to shoot them because there's too many. Well, there's a little satirical jab, isn't it? Um, what I'll do is I'll finish with a little, a little paragraph here of, to give you a, little, a, sort of, a little, little bit of an idea of what Pickwick as a dodo is like. Um, Thursday Next has smuggled him into her, bedroom, into her hotel room in Swindon, where she's now based, because, of course, they don't like allow pets in, uh, in her bedroom. And this is, uh, this is her um, with Pickwick. I checked in with Pickwick, Pickwick, who seemed to have settled in well. He made excited plock plock noises when he saw me. That's the wonderful thing about um, being a fiction writer and about extinct creatures, of course. Um, not only can you be a sort of semi-expert in four hours of fairly fast reading, um, but you can make up uh, huge amounts of facts, uh, you know, to fit um, the, the sort of the empty vacuum. Uh, he made excited plock plock noises when he saw me. Against the theories of experts, dodos had turned out to be surprisingly intelligent and quite agile. The ungainly bird of common legend was quite wrong. I gave him some peanuts and smuggled him up to my room under a coat. It wasn't that the kennels were dirty or anything, I just didn't want him to be alone. I put his favourite rug in the bath to give him somewhere to roost and laid out some paper. I told him I'd move him to my mother's the following day, then left him staring out of the window at the cars in the car park. Thank you very much. So, that's the end of our presentations. Uh, we're running a bit late, so I'm sure some people have got to leave, but we've just got a few moments to take questions from the audience, if anyone has any. So, it's only been sampled once for tissue, um, and that was the, the story that Jasper referred to, actually, that Beth Shapiro um, sampled it in the, the late 90s, um, and published it in Science in, in 2002. Um, we don't have a lot of tissue, but we, it doesn't require large amounts of tissue, so we, we do have enough. There's probably nothing that can be done. It, it's dried, it's degraded. Um, and in a way, we're waiting for the next generation of sequencing to come along um, that requires very small amounts. And, and the ultimate aim, once technology gets there, is that can we reconstruct the whole genome? That's an interesting question that we're having conversations about. Probably not with existing technology is the answer. I think that's one for my literary colleagues, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, alliteratively, uh, yes. I mean, it's, it's perfect, isn't it? It's dead as a dodo. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons why it became iconic. I mean, certainly, you know, for, for all the reasons you've heard. But also, the, yes, there's something about it. There's alliteration there that works, I think, really well. Dead as a dodo. Um, it's as dead as a dodo and as a doornail and, and everything else. Um, I, I was mentioning this, and I'm not saying that... that um, I, somebody, I was talking about dodos to somebody, and they, and they, heard, they said, do you hear that little ditty? And, um, and this isn't funny, so it's not meant to be a joke, although it was a rather badly taste joke at the time, um, about um, uh, when Diana had the accident, and they said, Diana has died... Dodie has died, the dodo is dead, uh, Dido should be worried. And, yeah, you shouldn't really laugh, because it's, it's in bad taste. But you, you see what I'm saying? There is, there is an alliterative effect of this, of this sound, you know, dodo, which, which is brilliant. If it had been called, you know, the, I don't know, the sort of, the, the, the gazernbird, it, it just wouldn't work, does it? it? It just doesn't work. But it's, as you said, it is very, very um, memorable. Mm. Um, and it's, it's a friendly word, it's, it's a nice word, and I think that's part of its, uh, its fame. And of course, um, 
uh, and Charles Dodson. Uh, if he hadn't have had the stutter, would he have actually put the dodo uh, in his book? And the answer is probably not. And then would it be, have the fame that it, that it has now? And this is history, you know, rests on this strange, you know, knife edge. Everything came right, this confluence of effect that, that give us this iconic bird. And, and I think it will be the iconic bird forever <laughs> in the... Right. Uh, right. The, the panel will fight over that <laughs> later, and then that will be part of the function in the court. So, I, if I yeah. just start, and then, then you can come in, Paul. Um, so, so, we know that the ancestor is flighted, um, and a flighted ancestor... Um, a Nicobar pigeon alike, if you like, a, a primitive Nicobar pigeon, um, would have settled on the islands respectively of, um, of Mauritius and Rodriguez. One of, uh, and once that bird is established there, there are no mammalian predators, there are no predators of any sort, there are no bird predators, no mammal predators. And isolated island faunas uh, have two common trends. Um, in birds, one of those is, is loss of flight. I've just spotted someone who can answer that better than me in the audience. But loss of flight. Uh, and the second one is uh, a radical change in size. And in some species, that will take the form of dwarfism. And in other species, it will take the form of gigantism. And so th the dodo and the Rodriguez solitaire are the, the descendants of a flighted ancestor uh, that colonised the, the isolated islands. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Paul. Well, j just to say that pigeons as a group are amazing flyers, as we know, yeah. racing pigeons. And I, I used to um, work in Indonesia and be way out at sea, and there'd be pigeons flying uh, past. And it's just this, you know, we, we often think that, you know, birds live on land and there's the sea, but for them, actually, they're just moving about with resources, and the sea's actually quite easy to move over. So pigeons have always moved big, long distances, and then, as Paul says, you know, if they get a nice island and you can, don't need to move on, then uh, you can become flight, flightless. But pigeons were, you know, they're very, quite seafaring birds, in a sense, although we don't think of that in that way. <laughs> and highly flightless. adaptable as well, which is one yeah, of the other absolutely. characteristics yeah. of the family. Time for one more. Yes, this is a fantastic discussion, and there's all the discussion about the, the ethics of um, uh, de-extinction as well. It does seem that within a few years, we, we'll never have a de-extinct species. We'll have a, uh, a species bred with traits of, a, of, an ex of an extinct species. But one of the arguments here is that the narrative of extinction is just a narrative of doom and gloom and loss. And that actually, that, that there's, there's a move now to a more hopeful, visionary uh, way of doing conservation and de-extinction is, is chiming for right or wrong with that sort of more hopeful uh, zeitgeist or whatever which is coming through. There's a sense that we've actually, you know, we've all had a bit no enough of the, the doom and gloom environmental narr narratives. We want a we-can-do-it uh, environmental uh, narrative and it's coming into that. I think that's an optimi optimistic note on which to, to end. We'll go downstairs uh, into the court of you. Give us a few minutes. We'll bring these specimens down so that you can have a, a closer look at the dodo and its near relatives. Many thanks for coming. I hope you've enjoyed it.